Make is one of these things that it's so simple, it's, it's something that's so basic. And when I ask or say the word make to all of you, you'll all come up with something that is just completely different. See, if I was going to go up to my sister and ask about the word make, she would tell me quite promptly about some dress that she has just put together with some new buttons that she found in a little corner store down the street. But you could ask me the same question and I'll, go, I'll, I'll tell you about how I made my flatmate really annoyed last night by the mess that I made in the kitchen. It's one of those things that it's, just got, it's got so much meanings behind it and it's really a, quite a fascinating word. So I ask this, in saying this, I ask all of you, what was the last thing that you made? And really think about this. Making is one of these things that always has a story developed behind it. It's, it comes from the interaction that you have with a certain task or an object. And one of the things that I really like about this is that it really brings a presence of time within it. So I could say, remember those awful mu muffins you made when we had no milk? And it immediately starts to bring in a certain period of time and a certain set of ideals and thinking that goes around it. And I felt this is really kind of quite fascinating because this, this story that comes along with the idea of making really starts to bring in sentimental values. So say if I, if I was to make an object, it's something that's really kind of fascinating and you, you have this am amazing amount of interaction and time that's spent with this object. And it's something that I really wanted to start pushing further in my design work. Now think about that and we put it in a, this kind of consumer culture that we've got at the moment. And there's this kind of thing that's happening is that designers like us are putting so much work and effort into a certain thing and there's, there's no real interaction that goes beyond the end use of it and really can compare that with how most objects that you interact with today. So let's put this in a little bit of context. This is Steve. Steve's outside on a nice sunny day and he thought that it'd be nice to turn this piece of paper into this paper plane. Now what, what is actually going on here? It's a very simple concept. There's, there's a, lot of, a paper plane is so simple, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. But what he's actually done here is he's, he, he's put in his own kind of personal time invested within this thing. But also he has gone through and put, in, put a certain amount of effort within it. Now, this is, the thing about this is if Steve's friend came along with a paper plane as well, you wouldn't want to swap. No, you, you'd want to see how your plane flew because this is, this is the investment of time that you put into this object. It's, it's not something that you're not interested about, your friend's one. It's something that you've gone in and carefully crafted all these folds and you want to see the reward that you benefit from this. And this idea of sentimental value can be, it can go across a whole lot of things within the design world and it's something that I wanted to capture in my studies this year. So why make? Why spend all this time making your own object going out and sourcing materials or doing a certain activity when you can easily just go forward and just buy something from the store. This is my room back at home. We moved in here earlier this year and I have this room that has this really annoying alcove in the corner and that's of course right where the window is and where my desk had to go. I want to look outside. Now the thing about this alcove is that no other desk would fit in there. I sat there and I really tried. I put my bed over here, my desk over here and nothing would really work out nicely. So I thought one weekend I was sitting there I was like no, nope, no. Nope. I'm going to go forward and I'm going to just buy a piece of plywood, buy a couple of lengths of timber and slap this thing together. Now, in an afternoon's work, you've got something that has directly kind of solved a certain problem and you've only invested a small amount of time in it. And within that, you've kind of, you feel emotionally connected with this object. Now, this desk, it's, it's not stable. It's, it's pretty bad. I mean, <laughs> I've, had, I've had to stand on that thing to fix my curtains once and that was, that was, that was scary. <laughs> and also, it hasn't got a nice surface. It's rough. And it made my room smell like linseed oil for at least two weeks. But the thing about this is that it's, it solved a certain problem. All of a sudden I've got a desk that fits in a context and I wouldn't have any other thing. This, this is the thing that has quite specifically fulfilled a need. And the thing about making is that it always comes from a need, a want, or a problem. So as a designer we get exposed to quite a lot of interesting tools which we get to use within our design process. And one of the things that I became interested in a few years ago is this idea of digital fabrication. And this to me was the next big step. This was, this was awesome. You have a machine essentially that makes something for you. Of course you tell it what to do, but it's, it's, it's going forward and processing it far beyond the capabilities of the human hands. Now th this is a little project that I started when I first became introduced this area. And it really was just a stepping stone to see 
what digital fabrication was all about. It was something that I wanted to explore personally myself. And one of the things that really kind of I noticed straight away was not so much the technological side of this, but how people are almost drawn into and compelled to know what this thing is. And I would go forward and I'll tell them about digital fabrication, and they would look at me and just be like, no, nah, no, nah, um, that's too much. I'd, I'd say how this computer is going to control a certain tool to process a material. And it was just something that wasn't relevant to them. It, it really didn't have something to really ground it and put it in a certain context. So one of the things that I really thought would be nice was to, instead of showing them the machine, so show them the object that it actually can create. Now this, this isn't my work, this is something that I've just downloaded off the internet, but this, this surfboard is designed by a guy named Mike Sheldrake, and the cool thing about it is that that's cardboard. That's cardboard wrapped with fiberglass. How, how cool is that? I mean, it's, with the power of digital fabrication, we're able to process something that is completely unique, and essentially you can put this together in your weekend. Compare that to something you can buy in the shop. So when you actually start to show them what you can make from this machine, they immediately see this, and they all of a sudden become interested in the machine that made it itself. And that they can actually start to draw connections between these two ideas. It's one of the things about digital fabrication is that people are so engrossed in the machine, they need to see where it can actually be put. So this is where, as a designer, I started to think maybe there's a way of, instead of designing for mass consumption, really start to drive in and start searching about how I can drive designing for mass customization. Because the thing about digital fabrication is that you have this power to change. It's not, it's not set to a certain way. I can make a table that fits a desk or a certain alcove in a room, and then you can go away and make something else as well. So you can really start to personalize an object and make it something that's really special to you. So when we look at the design process, it's, this is the thing that we got taught at uni, that it's a very linear approach. You normally start with a certain problem, an idea, a need. And from that, you start to research into it. This, this starts to develop a certain amount of scope within the project. You can see what's going on, where the potential is, what you don't want to go towards. From that, you kind of develop a certain set of concepts and you select one that's really got the most potential. From that, you develop it a little bit more and you finally end up with the end result. Now, the thing with this process is that the person who's actually going to use it is cut off. They don't see anything above this line here. And what, what the power that I initially found with digital fabrication is that you can move this line all the way up to the top here. They can start to be actively in control of what the end result will be. So the idea of digital fabrication and making it accessible and relevant to a wider audience can be kind of compared with the idea of motion capture. Now, everyone here would have seen this, well, most of you would have seen this movie, Avatar. Now, the thing about this is that it used a very intricate level of motion capture to create emotions within the face. Now, what's happened is that three or four years on, motion capture is now available in the home. And the way that this has actually been achieved is through the power of this. Now, I was talking to someone at the Fab 8 conference earlier this year, and the way that this has happened is that they've managed to get what's the most exciting bit about motion capture and put it in a product which everyone feels engaged and wants to start playing with. They've really kind of dumbed it down and just used the best bits of it. You don't see all the power and everything that's going on behind, you just see the end result. So that's something that I wanted to start looking at, is that digital fabrication is such a complex area why can't we just turn it into something that's really simple and that actually everyday people will be able to start playing with these things and seeing the potential of it so then hopefully the area will grow. This is the project that I managed to spend most of the year on. It was mind-numbing, but what the essential idea behind this was creating a product that is close to you. It's personal. It's something that you really feel compelled to hold on to instead of this kind of consumer culture where you want to throw it away. And the way that you can do this is actually start making a product which is specific to you. So think of a chair. A chair, an office chair, in fact, is something that's built to percentiles. It's something that is built to fit a proportion of the population. And this, is, this goes throughout. I mean, you, you, you've got average measurements going the whole way through. But what we can do here now is start changing this and actually make a chair that is measured for you. So this is something that I really wanted to start playing on. 
Now, the thing with actually being able to start looking into a process or a method is that what the, learning how the whole thing works. Now, I was, just, I was a statistics, statistics kid when I was younger, and I remember plotting drawings like this day in, day out, and thinking, what is this? How is this useful? I don't want to do this. But the thing with it is that with learning, you need to see the end result. You want to see what is going to come out from this thing that you're working on. So this is one of the graphs that actually plotted out and designed this chair. And what it's actually done, it's actually part of a larger scheme. Now, everyone will look at this. They'll be like, whoa. <laughs> and this is, this is the thing about fabrication is you look at it and you're like, whoa, that's, that's too much to handle. So what, what we really wanted to do was start just seeing the result, the end thing that comes from something like this. Just as a side note, this is the program that actually developed the, the chair. It, it works from a linear process going from the start on the left there all the way through to the right. And it draws out a certain set of mathematical equations which essentially comes out to it in an object. So what, what we actually start to see here is that when we start changing certain variables at the start, you look at the image on the left, you can start to see that the chair starts to change. And there we go, you've, you've wiped clean the slate of knowing what that program actually does, and you're just seeing the end result that comes from a certain, changing a certain thing. Now, what you can do here is actually hide the rest. It's just like the connect. We, we hide what's going on in the background and really just kind of bring out and bring forward the most exciting part of it. So the way we do this is through the idea of a GUI, a graphical user interface. So it's the same thing. We've immediately taken away all the bits that's confusing in this, and you can immediately understand what is going on here. I'm changing the shoulder height. It's directly influencing what the chair is going to do. Now, this is what I'd really like to see pushed further in digital fabrication, because it's something that has got so much power. People can easily go onto a website or an application, and they can tinker with this. They don't actually have to commit to making a whole chair, but they can just see what's actually going on here. So the idea behind this is that they'll be able to alter it themselves and then cut out their own chair on a setup in a, or in a community-based fabrication lab or through a hobby-based thing that, like the machine I showed you earlier. Now, the idea of a GUI or a graphical user interface, it isn't new. And this is the thing, this goes on all the time. It's happening right now. I mean, 70% of you guys have actually got a computer in your hands. Now, a, gra a user interface, Microsoft brought out their first one 17 years ago. And back then, people thought that computers had no practical application within the home. And now look at this. We've, it's everywhere. So this is something, when you really start looking at it, fabrication is that grassroots technology. This is, this is only just starting to pan out. So we can use this as a model to actually push fabrication further through this idea of simplic simplicity. So where to now? What, what really happens with this? I, I personally think that everyone is a maker in here. That, that it doesn't have to be complex, it doesn't have to be something that's really hard, just, just simple things. And I encourage everyone to make more. And further from this, I really want to see this idea of making become really engaged within the home. Now, Fabrication is something that, it's a community-based aspect, so anyone who's really kind of engaged and think this is quite interesting, get out there. Go and enjoy it. Really start to get amongst everyone and really engage with people who are smart. They want to really share their ideas and get them out there. So I encourage all of you to get into fabrication. Thank you.